sir. Uh, and we have a very special guest. Uh, of course, all our guests are special, including the father of our guest today. Uh, if we had uh, Chel Jokna, attorney Chel Jokna, Dean Chel Jokna in the past, now naman we have uh, uh, his uh, very talented son, Director Pepe Jokna. Thank you very much, uh, Director, for joining us. Richard, thank you for having me. Pleasure. I know that major the connection is not at best, unfortunately. But on sa dami mga umakyat dito sa Baguio, even the internet is a little bit overflowing. But uh, before we go into your uh, latest work, no, which is of course Gomborza, and we're seeing a lot of very very touching uh, reviews coming, including from my former colleague in GMA Network and good friend, of course, Atom. I don't know kung madali mapaluha si Atom Aralio, but uh, it it looks like you did something special there, no? Are you are, are you overwhelmed or surprised by the responses coming from Ricky Lee, from Otto Morelio, from people that both of you and I very much respect? I'm uh, touched, overwhelmed, yeah. Uh, honestly, I'm <laughs> excited. Um, so yesterday, I was really, really, you know, over the course of the last few days, I was feeling very anxious about how people would react to the film, receive the film, whether they would understand, whether they would um, feel for it. And so, even hearing the initial first few reactions, uh, first, uh, I heard that Atom was, he was eating um, say, in the same row as me. And oh, wow. I heard that he had started crying toward the end of the film. Um, and that really um, made me, uh, it, it, it really gave me joy because it, it told me that it, the film is connecting on an emotional level yeah. and then the day after when I got a message a personal message from Sir Ricky who said that he also liked the film it's Sir Ricky because he's my mentor um, yes. I studied screenwriting under him and so to hear that from your mentor was very touching and then yesterday uh, you know we our film is on the lower end of the spectrum when it comes to the number of cinemas playing our film so we we're all you know very very anxious very cautious but then hearing the initial reports of uh screenings getting sold out uh all around metro manila right um and in the some in, in the few provincial screens that we have and then hearing also reports from our checkers that um not just our checkers by the way but also family and friends who've seen the film hearing reports of people clapping and, and standing up at the end of the film and, wow. and, and crying at the end of the film wow. um really really just just mean it's 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 the best prize for me i am i'm really really happy right now well i mean I, i'm yet to watch it because for some reason i'm not sure it's available for sa dito sa Baguio, and, and i think by the, no it's not exactly yeah, it's not, i was hoping not. to watch it before i interview you but don't worry i'll, I'll make sure that you know I'll, I'll assess it on its own terms now i mean i remember the lines that nick joaquin used during the execution part and, and this is the towards the end of the very first chapter of a caution of heroes and i was you know brought to tears i'll be honest about that and uh you know everyone talks about rizal everyone talks about you know your usual suspects of illustrados but because before there was the illustrados there were of course the gomborzas right and and and, and that, that's where my question comes in why did you why did you think na dapat nagsimula tayo sa Gomburza? Sa tingin mo ba this was an unexplored part of our history? Or that the psychological and the emotional relevance of that and the impact on the Rizal generation was perhaps not as appreciated uh, by the available film arts and education system that we have? Uh, well, the film originated with just with the communications, Jesscom. Um, they have produced, this is their second feature film, they, uh, they produced Ignacio de Loyola previously. Um, they had the idea to make the film, um, and I think for them it was, of course, a connection to the story of, of priests. At the same time, they had also wanted to make this film as a tribute to the 500 years of the church in the Philippines. Ah, right, right. Um, and... Uh, after they got the idea, they, they asked a bunch of directors to, to you know, to meet and pitch their take on on the film. And, and I had, uh, in that process, read about the three priests. Uh, my connection was a bit different. Uh, I, of course, got a lot of priests, <laughs> and I don't consider myself a very religious person also. And I, you know, when I, honestly, when I heard celebration of 500 years of the church i also had the question is that even something to be celebrated <laughs> but that's, but that's right right that's who i am um 
I, but the more I I I, I read uh, about composers, the more I began to understand why why they were so important beyond them being priests. And this is what I came to just come with the, the the story. This is a story not about them as priests, but about them as human beings. And when we, when 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 I when I said that, they agreed with that. This is a celebration of their humanity, because at that time, uh, their humanity was being denied by the Spanish government. They were not given. We all of us, whether we were uh, Indio or or half Spanish, we were not given the same rights as people who were born in Spain yeah. because they colonial subjects we were just colonial yes. subjects yep exactly exactly so so when we all agreed on that this is a celebration of humanity it's a right. celebration of of uh of how the question of humanity uh, gave birth to what it means to be filipino then that's where we that's where the ball started to get rolling with the film yeah i mean that's that's a very important intervention no i mean in a way, joke. I mean, I think. Did you have a background in in, in Ateneo? I, I I mean, usually in UP, right? The idea is that oh, Rizal, he was a reformist, blah blah blah. It's really Bonifacio was the real revolutionary. No offense to my friends and colleagues in UP, but I always found found that the baloney because Rizal's liberalism and republicanism was revolutionary in the context of colonial subjugation, and to push the logic even further, to ask for you know you my Filipino-born individuals to be priests. And to spread the message of the Lord uh, to the people without direct intervention uh, from Madrid and subjugation, that was a form of revolutionary politics in itself, right? I mean, again, people tend to look at the church a hundred years later or they tend to extrapolate what's happening back then to today, but we have to understand things in their own context. No? And now, so, so Nick Joaquin considered uh, Padre Borgus as the first major hero uh, in the struggle for Philippine nationalism. What was your understanding of it? What works, what films, uh, what kind of literature inspired your framing? I mean, there's so many ways to approach the Gomborza uh, martyrdom, right? Who influenced you the most? What was your intellectual and, and historical approach? Uh, well, uh, just to backtrack a little bit, I'm actually not from Ateneo. Uh, I studied in La Salle. Yeah. And, I don't ask La Salle, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Sorry about that. Yeah, so, honestly, yeah, that's one of the first things. Oh, sorry. That's one of the first things I said. You guys know I'm not from Ateneo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, La Salle, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, 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 it's okay, it's okay. Uh, no, but, but it, 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 uh, they, of course, they, 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 they had known that I studied in, in La Salle. Ateneans and La Salleans are, are friends. And I even have this dichotomy between the <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, in terms of research, um, there are a lot of conflicting uh, historical accounts about Coburna uh, and about the Cavite mutiny, uh, which uh, is the reason why Coburna was executed. So the Cavite mutiny happened in, in 1872. It was an, an opera. It was a mutiny uh, within Fort San Felipe in Cavite, and uh, some accounts had said that it was just, you know, uh, 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 soldiers who are unhappy and wanting more uh, wages or, or less taxes and, and, um, uh, and a few things. We can get into that later. Other accounts had said, no, this was a revolutionary uh, movement. Um, so we, we had considered a script that had, for example, all these, you know, all these... Uh, competing accounts and we decided that we needed to stick to one, mm. one account and, and that was uh, heavily informed by the works of Father Schumacher who is a Jesuit and also one of our foremost historians I think about that era. Um, so Father Schumacher had written a lot about Burgos, about Burgos' manifesto uh, which even that Burgos had written a manifesto which he signed Los Filipinos which is one of the first uh, documents where we see Filipinos being used as a term to describe us right, or, right. or at least their group. Um, some accounts say that he wrote it, others didn't. So we had to say, no, uh, we, we, we went to Father Schumacher who said he did write the Burgos Manifesto. Father Schumacher had also written an account of Cavite Mutiny called Cavite Mutiny uh, Definitive History. So those were our, our primary sources, and and uh, he had laid out very, uh, very brilliantly, also very succinctly, why yeah. he believed that 
the Cavite mutiny was a revolutionary movement. Um, so you know, those are the two primary sources. And then, and then here and there, we would get others. Of course, uh, I asked a lot from my Tita Maris, who used to head the National Historical Commission. Yeah. Um, I, I would call her every now and then, especially during the shoot. Uh, of course, we, me and the actors read a lot of uh, Sir Ambeth Ocampo's colors. Right. Um, especially, and that uh, helped us especially with the Garote scene, with the execution. We really pulled up for uh, for the execution scene, word for word. We used the last words of Gomez and Burgos, as uh, as was written in Sir Ambet's columns. Um, so yeah, it, it was it was fun, actually, doing all that research for this film. We ended up with a script that was 130 something, almost 140 pages, um, and then, of course we we had to trim it down uh and and so uh during the pandemic actually it took us two years to really keep working on the script back and forth um shorten it streamline it in terms of you know zeroing in on what is the story we're trying to tell here yeah uh and then we ended up with an 85 or so page script which is what you'll see in the movie house yeah sorry if i'm i'm geeking over this actually to be honest the first time i heard about your project was when I was in Madrid uh, earlier this year on March, we had this, you know, uh, annual Philippine Spain kind of event, you know, that scholars from both sides come together, uh, experts and officials. And from a good friend of mine, uh, uh, the, I heard that, uh, so we were talking about Philippine Spain and how, you know, as a Filipino being Spain, it's a kind of a mixed feeling, right? At the same time, there's a kind of a chip on our shoulders uh, because of the whole thing that happened to Rizal. In fact, the occasion of our visit there because our event was in Institute Cervantes, no? was, uh, you know, Rizal's work officially were inducted into the Hall of Fame of Spanish literature, right? So it was a very special moment, you know, goosebump moment. Uh, so as a Filipino, you feel so proud that a fellow Filipino or, or the father of the Filipino nation in some ways is now part of the Spanish canon uh, with Cervantes and the whole thing, uh, Liosa, Marquez and all of that. But at the same time, of course, there's also this kind of a semi-alienation and bitterness and all of that because of the American influence, the interlude and everything that came after. Now, uh, so the conversation I was having with friends was, you know, how are we going to rediscover this sense of our Spanish past and also that sense of alienation we have towards the Spanish language. In fact, I was telling, telling my Spanish friends that in the Philippines, Spanish is treated like French. It's like the language of the posh and elite. And they were like super shocked. It's like, yeah, like this, you know, like like in, like in the in the US, Spanish is the language of, you know what I'm saying, right? But but to Philippines, like the one the ones who speak Spanish are like the elite and posh. And then in that context, your your movie and project came you know, was was discussed by friends. I didn't know you were the director, but the the organization that we're mentioning um was so I was wondering like, hmm, is this gonna be a religious movie or a historical movie and how are they gonna put it together? So when I got to know it's actually you who is overseeing it, I felt very confident because I know you're not a particularly religious person. And I think the reason Akala ko Ateneo ka, because I remember your TED talk in Ateneo about yeah, what's yeah. holding. Yeah, I I'm sorry. So there was a kind of visual. Uh, uh, so we'll discuss that separately because I want to also take your uh, get your take on the Philippine cinema as general. Uh, but now let's focus on this movie yet. What was the thing that push you? Uh, where does this because I do as, as a writer if you're gonna write something I always say okay I just feel this issue was not properly discussed or I can do a better job right or I have to refresh this for a new generation right you have to justify putting two years of your life into writing 400 pages or so right I'm sure for a director like you this is also a very exacting job what is the thought process behind it uh, Pepe yeah, well, for me uh, the core of it was um, the, the the little tidbit that the term Filipino came from the movement of these uh, Philippine-born priests. But at the time, uh, people who were born here, who were living here, did not call ourselves Filipino. We called our we were called Indios. Right. The Spanish called us uh, Peninsulares. The people who were born in Spain were called Insulares. Between us. Who were born here, we would divide ourselves or call ourselves according to our region. So I am Tagalog, I am Visaya, or Sopano, right. I am Nicolano, etc. Um, but the term Filipino had begun with 
the secularization movement of the three of the priests, of which uh, Goborza were a part of. And then it sort of spread uh, from from them to other sectors of society. The illustrados that we uh, call now, they have begun to also imbibe the word. Uh, and then it spread until the, uh, the revolution, actually. So that, to me, caught my fascination, the idea that a word could spread that if, like a fire. Yeah. And it could capture the imagination of a people and also unite a people. Because we were very much, I think, fragmented then in the in sense that uh, the concerns of the uh, the illustrado class were not shared by the concerns of the Indios, quote unquote, and were not shared by the concerns of uh, people, uh, um, local born who were in the military. But when Gomborza was killed, um, and everybody saw that they had all converged on these three, three priests and went, that, that's me. That's that's uh, the injustice that they face is the same injustice that I, I, I face or can face. And that was a that was a unifying moment for us as a country. So that that's that's the core that that inspired me with the film. And and and, and uh, director Jok, I mean. <laughs> I, of course, if you go back to your own family, I think your great grandfather was involved in this, right? He was one of one of the first admirals. So essentially, you can say one of the first admirals of the Philippines. Uh, you know, the the, the great joke, no, no, uh, the first one. And if I'm not mistaken, you guys are related even to uh, Marikina. I mean, like the the one of the back in the day centuries before you know so i was just doing a background oh, really? check about you joknos and all <laughs> but but does your own family's uh background your great grandfather's contribution to the revolution did that also kind of contribute to your sense of responsibility passion that you have to keep this going i'm sorry if that that came like a curveball but i was also i didn't also know that i knew your grandfather uh the great joke no but but i didn't know that your great great grandfather was was such a central figure in the philippine revolution yeah, he was. He, he was actually uh, there. I, there's like I think statues of him in Visayas. Yes, he led, exactly. Yeah, I think the revolution in um, in Visayas. Although he was from Taal, Batangas, um, uh, I, I would hear stories of him growing up, uh, but they were like m more like light anecdotes. Like I, I heard uh, that he was so fat. Uh, <laughs> that he got shot once in the stomach, pero hindi to magos, because he was so fat, so it didn't it didn't penetrate his internal organs. Uh, but 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 yeah, it's only recent in recent years that I also started to learn more about him. Um, Seriously, and, but there you go. Yeah, I mean, of course we're talking about Ananias yeah, yeah, yeah. Diokne in Noblias, no? Yeah, this Ananias. Is, yeah, Ananias. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Ananias. Yeah. This is your I, great I great grandfather. Yeah. Yeah, I, I visited his grave for the first time last year for the for, for the first time this year actually all this yeah. time it's he has been buried in the uh the al cathedral the al cathedral right. um is a beautiful a large i think it's it, sorry the al, the al basilica is the, it's a very beautiful large i think it's one of the largest in southeast asia um church it sits on a hill overlooking the whole town of the al and then you can see the lake in the distance uh, we shot there actually. Uh, Gomborza was shot in Tahoe, right, right, uh, and as well as in Quezon and Manila in, in Tomoros. But yeah, he was buried. He is buried there, and so for the first time I visited. And um, but yeah, it, uh, uh, I'm also the sort of geeky out on that part of history. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm the reason I, I'm just throwing that before we go back. I'm sorry, Major, all over the place. I ADHD, ako. but I, I'm, just, I'm just telling you, there's so many amazing stories. I mean, that, to to you know to extrapolate and make movies about. I mean, I, I was just looking at the news a few days ago from Vatican, etong ex samurai who became a priest coming to the Philippines and now being considered for a saint. You know, this is Dom Yosto Takayama, right? I mean, like, there's so oh, much. Shit. I know, I mean, that's, an ex-samurai, he gives up. That's yeah, a that's a movie, right? I was just, I was just thinking. So he was, he was, you know, martyred in the Philippines, uh, you know, um, so he was a former elite samurai. He gives up his family, he comes over to the Philippines, he becomes a priest, he performs miracles, and now Vatican is considering uh, beatify him into a, into a saint. So, I mean, those are like stories that you cannot make up, man. I mean, this is out of this world. Yeah, I have an How audience. Was he martyred? How was he martyred? 
it were able to kill a salmon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I know this. <laughs> this is something. So sorry if I'm geeking over that. Now, uh, going back to uh, before our gentleman, our friend here. Now going back to this Gomburza. Uh, how did you come about with your? Um, casting choices i mean obviously you had a lot of handy that last time i checked like gombors uh, uh padre borgos was our age right I, I think it was like 34 35 right uh, we're the same age apparently so what was how, how did you choose the uh young casting how was it influenced by the actual historical facts and details yeah mm. uh yes borgos and zamora were around mid 30s 34 yeah. 35. uh i was surprised actually when i started doing research one of the first things that surprised me was that Gomez was much older. He was yes. around late 70s when he was killed. Because the, the puppet edition, which I think was drawn by Rizal, uh, shows the three priests that they all look at the same age. Exactly. Uh, so but they're actually spread. Really yeah, yeah. yeah. But they're like um, almost, two, three, uh, almost like two generations apart, right? Almost, yeah. 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 Uh, so it, the casting began with having all these characters that we had in the script and then we tried as much as possible to look for or reference photos for each so first the three priests and then Pelaez. uh and then it was really a matter of looking it was important for me to cast actors who were a little bit um who, who had a resemblance to that to to the, the real thing um, i don't know why actually but it's it's it, for me it was, it was just a sense of like being faithful i guess uh i also sort of didn't want I, I knew that we had a smaller budget also and we didn't have a lot of time to shoot the film we actually only shot the film in 17 days uh, which is very very short for a historical film so i knew we didn't have that time Wait, to do first you, you did the whole thing in just over two weeks yeah wow just, like just over two Space weeks wow yeah, spaced yeah. out over the course of uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but still months, but still yeah like 17 shooting weeks so yeah, we didn't have the time or budget to do a lot of prosthetics. So that's why um, the, the resemblance was important to me. Ah, so right, Cedric, right, right. for example, if you put his picture side by side with Burgos, it's for me, it's it's Agani. I, I think he really does. Yeah. He looked like Burgos, but he also imbibes, I think, uh, the spirit of Burgos that I had read in Burgos' writings. So the same was for... Uh, Sir Dante Rivero and for Anchong. Uh, it started with those times, but I really, really did, did believe them. I, I really do love them as, as actors. Uh, Piolo, actually. Piolo, if you put Piolo side by side with a picture of Pelaez. Yes, Pelaez, yes, like square, yes. Square jawed, look like a, you know, look like a movie star. Uh, Pelaez is actually, is actually one of, I think, uh, one of, also an unsung hero uh, in our history. Some, someone that we owe a lot to also so i'm happy that he said yes to the film but yeah so it, it was that i had a google sheet with all of the characters names and all of the pictures and then um actors that we wanted to cast and then we i really did pitch them one by one uh, i did meet with them one by one to tell them what the film is about uh, what who their character is and um to also tell them that it wasn't going to be a typical kind of shoot that it was going to be um, quite challenging especially for uh, uh, the, the priests who had Spanish dialogue like they needed to commit to working with this, a language coach and getting the Spanish right and, and and the prop I mean just not any Spanish the Spanish of the Castilians during that time right I mean it, or, or the mm. Filipino Spanish right the Filipinized Spanish also is quite different from Spanish Spain right so I, I don't know I, I'm sure we have Spanish language experts who are gonna have their own praise for the effort that you put uh, into hopefully. it yeah. hopefully yeah hopefully, hopefully. I'm, hopefully. I'm still waiting hopefully. for the experts but, yeah. yeah yeah but yeah but that language was also an important part uh, of, of the film we did I didn't want for example the the, the Spanish governor general or the Spanish friars to be speaking in Filipino yeah yeah, yeah. Um, because it, it, that's authenticity not accurate yeah but also but also because we wanted to heighten the feeling of this is us and that's them yeah and they 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 you know they were they felt they were above us they were speaking a different language so when it came to the filipino characters quote unquote in our film we all had them speaking tagalog uh but it was very important for us that the governor general the spanish friars uh anything that had to deal with you know uh, like being in court uh, that had to be in, in Spanish. That's a very important point, no? I mean, um, I mean, you and I have been all around the world and have dealt with all sorts of people, but 
I'll admit it. Uh, you know, the first time I was in Spain, and, and you know, and I was in this quite a regal place, right? I, I won't say exactly where. It was a very regal place, and then the Spanish officials were coming out and giving speeches in this very sophisticated Madrid accent and all of that. So, like for a moment, I said, I transposed myself. I said, if I were the same non-white man, yeah, here 100, 120 years ago, how would I feel? And if I couldn't speak Spanish exactly like them, let's say. I'm still articulate, but I couldn't speak it with that kind of, you know, accent, posh Madrid accent. And and you could see that they would look at me as a colonial subject. Like, ang dali magi matapang yun, de ba? And and you know, we are in the woke era. Let's be honest. You know, we have uh, us, the non, you know, Caucasian, non-Western people, have some voice and platform today. But 120, 140, 150 years ago, my goodness, the level of courage and audacity you had to have. So, I, I like the fact that you emphasize that that. that the, the language, I won't say barrier, but but the kind of a language case or cast, no? And also, the, okay, yeah. yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, they, 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 well, most Filipinos at the time did not speak Spanish and could not understand Spanish. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I, I, I actually do not know uh, why they didn't, why they, they because I, I know that the, it's in the film. One of the lines in the film is that the king, there was a there was a, a decree, I think, a royal decree that Spanish must be taught to the natives. Right. But it was the friars who did not uh, uh, do a good job in in teaching. I, I I don't know what it is, and I don't know what the difference is between mm. us and and in Mexico, where in Mexico uh, the locals were taught Spanish. That's, well, I mean, of course, yeah. the argument there is the uh, the friars had an interest in monopolizing the language because monopoly in the language was a, a sort of monopoly on power, right? Because if you don't know the language, you cannot fight it in the courts. You cannot speak the language of power, right? So there was, you're correct, that there was some tension between the civilian secular administration in Spain, which at times was actually quite liberal and influenced by the Napoleonic Code and the very conservative, some would say retrogressive, friars who had an interest in keeping a certain medieval feudalistic structure in the Philippines, right? Which is a very different trajectory from the rest of Latin America. Kaya sabi ko, ang Philippines is parang, it's a double solitude, right? We're very dissimilar from most of our Asian counterparts. At the same time, we're also very dissimilar from Latin Americans, a lot of whom had huge influx of Spanish people and very much were drenched in the Spanish language in ways that we're not. So, yeah. kaya our identity crisis and all of these problems we're facing could also go to that weird, exceptional situation we had in the Philippines in the late 19th century. And yet, we had these revolutionaries. And yet, we had these martyrs, right, against all odds. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you mentioned identity crisis. No, that, that 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 to me is still still like a, a, a burning question that I don't have any answers to. Now, uh, uh, before we transition to the other next part, which is you know I want to get your ideas on the Philippine cinema, etc. Why do you think people should watch this movie? I mean, not as a salesman. I mean, obviously you're the director. You want people to go out there. This movie, I you know I'm I'm gonna endorse it hundred times. Don't worry about it. But but why do you think as Filipinos we should watch a movie like this? And what are the things we should look forward to? What is what is a unique thing that Pepe Jokno brings to this movie? Because, you know, thankfully, this is not the first great historical movie. I mean, we can have a debate about the effect of General Luna movie. I mean, my theory is that it helped Duterte <laughs> come to power, right? <laughs> By glorifying and romanticizing the strongman, the cost cos you know the uh, the costly strongman kutob ko nga si Digong nga yung yung nagmumura siya ginaya lang niya si Enora Luna may meron kong ano eh suspecha diyan eh but you know we 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 have a recent history over the past 10 years all of this historical biopic coming up and doing well commercially they're making pop culture effect and even political effect so i mean what is it is, is there something unique here uh, about your approach or what makes it unique uh, and why should people watch this as filipinos uh, um, I'll, I'll talk about it as a, from from the perspective of Munag Borza, because I think Munag Borza is uh, that it, it doesn't fit the mold of what we consider a historical, uh, mm. you know, hero. Um, right. Actually, when I first uh, entered the project and I was talking to uh, a historian about it, uh, the historian was quick to point out that this. Uh, the, the, technically, they're not heroes. They are martyrs. 
Right. Can you make the distinction uh, between uh, martyrs and heroes? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, they were doing for their cause, but uh, after, they were three priests actually who never fought on the battlefield. Mm. I guess is what the person was trying to say. I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not so sure. Uh, and, and you know, there, there was there's still all that uh, speculation about. I mean, there were these, as I mentioned a while ago, uh, competing uh, texts about whether right. Lewis did or didn't write his manifesto. Again, we went with. Father Schumacher, who said that he did. But uh, yeah, these three unassuming priests who were caught in a political uh, upheaval, a time of political upheaval, they were not like. Uh, um, and also, we have to remember that they lived at a time when the concept of us being an independent nation was. Uh, that was years Take it away. away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, the, the proximity to the revolution. Um, is farther than uh, Rizal and Bonifacio, number one. And and, uh, and, and all of the heroes that we've seen in film um, recently. Number two, uh, they, as I mentioned, were not, uh, didn't fight in the battlefield. And at the same time, uh, they, they didn't lead those revolutionary movements. So I, when I first entered, I also, the project, I also asked myself, what's the hullabaloo about these three unassuming priests? Right. Uh, and then I started to read, and I read that Jose Rizal had been so inspired by the mm. Atipunan that he dedicated El Fili. Uh, sorry, so, sorry, inspired by the three priests. That the martyrdom, yeah. El uh, to Comburza. And in a letter to a friend, he also said that without Comburza, he says he would not have written his two novels. He says he would probably be uh, a Jesuit friar, something like that. Um, why was why was Rizal so inspired by by them? Why was Katipunan so inspired by Kumburza that Katipunan uh, actually used um, pieces of black cloth as anting anting? Um, in, in their membership rights as well, right. believing those, that those pieces of black cloth were pieces from the cut from the sutanas of the three right. priests. And so the more I started doing research and the more I dug into their story, and as we were making the film, I understood why uh, our heroes were inspired by these martyrs. And it's because uh, I feel that the story of these three priests is the story not of individual heroism but the story of a collective mm. the story of how an idea can travel from person to person uh it's the story not just of battle but also of sacrifice and i think these uh, are very filipino values we tend i think hopefully we tend to value the uh more than the individual i think that uh, is also common within asian societies right and then when i when when i sort of thought i mean when i um, had uncovered that sort of angle to it. That's when I realized that, that that's what our uh, heroes were inspired by. They were so inspired by by, by those values that Kaborza had espoused. Um, mm. And, and I, so that's why I think it's it, the story is important. Uh, it is different from right. you know, the usual singular bombastic hero that we're used to. But it's a, a message that I think we still need to, to learn that, you know, that, that all of us carry these little fires within us. Uh, all of us have the responsibility to protect them. All of us have a, a role in this collective story that we have as Filipinos. Uh, and, and sometimes the outcomes are not going to be great for us. Sometimes it could cost us our, our life, our liberty, but we should not quit. Mm. And we should be, I think, brave in, in the face of these challenges. That's what I, I love right. about the story of Gomorrah. I mean, my way of looking at it is two ways. Spiritually, I mean, there's always a John the Baptist before, I mean, before Jesus Christ, right? There was a John the Baptist, right? Uh, you know, even if you're not the final Messiah, there's always this very important figure, right? Uh, that lays the foundation, right? For the fulfillment of the prophecy. So there's, that's one way of looking at things that, you know, even though certain individuals were not the revolutionary per se, the conscious political actors, they help create the emotional, the psychological and the political conditions for that. I don't think the Philippines was the same place after 
the execution of the Gomburza, right? I think this affected not only Rizal, his brother, everyone who watched it, everyone was shaken to their core because the injustice of the system, the barbarity of the system was really embodied by what happened, especially the emotional way they responded to their execution. Like, we're not against the system. We're, you know, it just showed how ridiculous exactly. that colonial system was. So, but the second thing, you know, in a way you could say they were accidental revolutionaries, right? I mean, in many ways, the greatest figures in history were not consciously trying to contribute to a political outcome. A lot of times, reformers become inevitable revolutionaries when they want to change things from within. I mean, we can talk about French Revolution, Russian Revolution. So, so for me, I, I personally see the Gomborzas as not only martyrs, but if not conscious revolutionaries, at least they were the accidental revolutionaries. In a spiritual sense, maybe there's the John Baptist that came after. You know, uh, you know, they created the conditions for what would happen a decade yeah. or two later on. Uh, and, and I would also yeah, venture and call them heroes as well. I mean, yeah. um, I think heroes are, are titles are called, but the term of the, the title hero is something that we as people give. And if Kobor's like gives us this feeling from word, um, of, of inspiration, of being Filipino, of patriotism, if Kobor's uh, stands for something bigger than us as individuals, then I think they should be called, definitely be called heroes. Right, and then last point on, on the movie. If um, what is the what is the Pepe joke no oeuvre, right? Or what is a special touch? Is it the cinematography? Is it the emotional aspect of this? I mean, because in fairness, you know, you move in Cesar Montana's Rizal. I think there was a lot of uh, you know investment in the language, in the authenticity. I was very impressed by that movie. The emotionality of it, I think, with the Henry Luna movie, the, the the again the emotion of the moment, the uh, and even the uh, the script, everything was very sophisticated. But I, but I think one of the things you're known for, and also one of the things that I see in the initial reviews, is it's just this absolutely stunning uh, cinematography that captures just the inanity of the injustices of that moment, but also the the emotional depth. And the tragedy that that martyrdom of Gomborza represented. Am I am I, am I over reading into this? I mean, <laughs> how do you see that? What how, what is your read on that, uh, with uh, Pepe? I I I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 I I don't know what to how I mean. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know how to define what my touch is. But all the cinematography is very very. Um, lucky, honored that uh, Carlo Mendoza uh, agreed to do the cinematography. Carlo is a good friend. He also right. did, uh, he's done a lot of historical films actually. He did Rosario, he did Bonifacio, I think. He's right. uh, one of my favorite uh, cinematographers. Not, you know, not just, um, I mean, looking at his works that, you know, uh, we did work on together. So, Carlo, I think, and I have a uh, very good working relationship where at the beginning of the process we really align on what we what we think the film is about right what we think the, the message of the film is and uh from there our, our our visual language comes out um so we had a lot of discussions with me carlo and uh, ericsson uh, my production designer, as well as uh, Paul and Ernest, our producers, we w we had uh, uh, weeks of going through the script and and discussing what it means, not just from a production perspective, but from a uh, narrative and from uh, uh, storytelling perspective, but also what the messages that we're trying to portray. Uh, and from those discussions, the ideas, you know, the 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 images of fire came out. Like it was a present thing. It wasn't in the script. But it was in all of our heads, and so that that fire, the little flames, uh, Carlo eventually used in the cinematography. Um, there are some scenes that are pretty dark, especially in the right. prison scene that's only lit by candles because we wanted to show, yeah. you know, that, that these little flames still, you know, struggling with this the giant um, uh, patch of darkness. Right. Yeah. And there are other scenes where. It, there may not be candles, but the sky looks like flame. Uh, so that was all informed by this this message that we had of, of a little fire that just kept right. growing, and growing, and growing, until it became that's a good uh, one, yeah. the nation that we are now. And and and, baby, I mean, 
what is the impact you're hoping this movie to have and what do you think uh, you know the audience should look forward to if there's a one or three things perhaps they should look forward to uh, Ano Masai Mo because I'm seeing already a lot of people are saying this is on their number one list of things to watch uh, in the coming days or so yeah I'm, I'm, I'm really happy uh, yesterday I was being sent some messages uh, of uh, people who had watched the film uh and then they were saying that at the end of the film people were crying people uh were clapping uh, other reports because Cebu Maitita said her friend had watched and uh, people stood up and it clapped at the end uh yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I just came from Mega Mall actually because we did I did the rounds a while ago with right. uh, Cedric and Chong uh Tommy who plays uh Buen Camino and Elijah who plays Pashano so we went to um, SM North and then in SM Mega Mall we were able to catch the end of the film and really, at the end of the film, it was it made my uh, hair stand because people were, were yeah, goosebumps. Were crying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, people were crying and, and clapping at the end of the film. We went in front of the, the of the screen as the credits were rolling to say thank you, and people really came forward. Like we couldn't stop it, but we had this isang nanay who uh, couldn't stop herself. So she, while we were talking, she came forward and then she she hung. Um, she hugged Cedric and, and she was crying and, and she said uh, she was thanking him for his performance as Burgos. So that that to me was like, is, is like the best, uh, uh, it's the best part of this process. Yeah. Like, about seeing that kind of reaction. Um, it's amazing. Because this is supposed to be a conversation too, right? A conversation with the audience and you want to start a conversation after this. Uh, speaking of which, Pepe, <laughs> I don't want to get ahead of myself or ahead of you in that sense, but should we look forward to this being a beginning of a new kind of a series or a, a kind of a genre of this kind? Of, because honestly, Pepe, I really, don't, I really think there's so much that we need to properly understand about where we come from. All of this identity crisis, political crisis, all of these problems we're having today as Filipinos in the 21st century, the root of that is because we don't understand the root or we don't go back enough to the root in ways that a lot of our neighbors do, right? I mean, you and I have gone yeah. around the world. I mean, go to I don't know, Turkey, China, Israel, whatever country. A lot of them are very deeply rooted in their history. And I just felt we have such a rich history uh, but thankfully now, finally, we're having this enriched approach to understanding that history. Uh, see this as part of a beginning of a new era of more historically, uh, you know, historically relevant and socially relevant at the same time, emotionally compelling kind of stories uh, in the Philippines. I hope, I hope, we, I hope producers never stop producing uh, historical films because it is a risk. Uh, not all historical films have uh been successful actually and so we just taking on this project and and, and combined with the fact that it's more expensive to produce yeah. a historical film because you have to do the sets and, and the locations yeah. and, and the props and all that and uh do a lot of work to get back to the era uh but i, I hope and I, I hope that uh at least cinema helps uh but yeah discussions uh will also definitely uh, push forward i was thinking a lot about this actually recently because it, uh, I came from Italy, and uh, a few months ago, we were being toured around uh, Torino, which yeah. is a city up north. It was the original capital of Italy before it was moved out, uh, which is now it's so it's now in Rome. And my friend, uh, who was touring us around, she was geeking about a politician named Cavour. Yeah, yeah. So they, I mean, Am I getting it right? Anyway, I, yes, I'm yes, go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. yes. And because and, uh, uh, I think the agreement to make Italy a republic came was signed in Torino, and then from there the, the ruling family in Torino had unified uh, in Italy. And once they had done so, uh, she was saying, my favorite quote from Cavour is, uh, okay, now we made Italy, next we have to make Italians. And and I um it's a national um, project, so yeah. It's a project, yeah. It's, it, it's a project, yeah. It's, it's a project, it's an ongoing project. Like we tend to think of That's we tend true. to look at countries and, and think that they organically maybe they did, but that, mm. that they that they that they didn't work for their nation, but actually the truth is they did. They had to construct yeah. it, they had to build it brick by brick. So uh the Italian language I think that we know now was actually not 
widely spoken at the right. beginning of the last century. Like it was a language they all had to learn, which reminds me of Bahasa Indonesia, for example, which I think they chose, if I'm not mistaken, the least spoken dialect and made that their national language in order to foster unity. Right. Even just like things like uh, I, I read recently that Ad Thai is actually not a very true. It's a it's a modern creation right. that uh, their government had had. Uh, with the same with the Germans and and, and and the same with German and this I mean Deutsch uh, and the same thing with the uh, I mean look at Spain today up until today it's not a finished project. Catalonians still a lot of them still exactly. want to separate from Spain right? They're still Basque right? Where a lot of Filipinos including you know my Foronda family name that's the Basque name. You know even Spain Madre España supposedly it's still a national project that is incomplete. So I think we feel. Filipinos tend to have this romanticized idea that oh, uh, naman mga kapitbahay natin mga ibang bansa. They, they were born with the no notion of a nation. No, it's a project. It comes with sacrifice. It comes with investment. It comes with emotional attachment. It comes with people like you and me. I mean, sharing our ideas and getting ideas and and debating about it. So, a Filipino ness is an evolving project, right? I mean, it is. Creating Filipinos is an evolving project, and we are a young country. Right. Uh, I would say relatively. Uh, so what are the stories that we tell each other? What do we, what, how do we describe ourselves to one another? That is all part of the construction of our Filipino identity. So if we don't have it now, then um, we have to keep building it. Yeah, and, and that's the reason why. I mean, uh, 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 Pepe, I mean, I always have this problem about ang, ang Pilipino, ay Moreno, again, again. No, no, I mean, look at the first Filipinos. A lot of them were Creole. Look at Manuel Quezon. Uh, he was a Creole, our first, you know, com our Commonwealth president. Uh, look at a lot of our Ilustrados. They were uh, part Chinese mestizo, part Spanish. I mean, the idea that, you know, just being Malayan, Tagalog speaking to be a Filipino, I mean, that's a myth because from the very beginning, we were a very cosmopolitan, inclusive nation and many different quote unquote races and ethnicities. Is women, men contributed to the birth of the Philippine nation, especially considering Mang I mean, if you look at even the Gumburses, right? Padre Borgos himself, I think the father was Guardia Civil, no? Had Sp uh, Spaniel blood yeah. and part Cordilleran Ilohana, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, I'm in Baguio right now in the north, right? So so a lot of them were from very mixed, mixed ethnic and, uh, you know, even yes. racial background, yeah. Uh, Gomez, I had some uh, Chinese blood, I think. Exactly. So, you know, there's the Filipino is not one or, or, or the other thing. It's really all of these things uh, put together. Um, in the last 10 minutes, I want to go back, uh, if, if possible. Can you put up, put your hat as, as the kind of a film cinema guy? I, I want your, the, the word expert because, you know, you're too humble for that. But I remember your TEDx talk in Ateneo. Uh, that's why I made the mistake in Ateneo. About yung basa mo dun sa ugat ng problema sa Philippine cinema bakit bumaba yung kalidad ng cinema sa Pilipinas bakit tayo na pag-iwanan ng mga ibang bansa bakit ngayon Korea and all of that at ang idea mo is that hindi ito sa kakulangan ng talento hindi to sa kakulangan ng mga director at mga artista and actors marami tayong talento it's all about organization and more importantly regulation so since you gave that talk it's like a decade ago if i'm not mistaken um how have things changed for the better? And, and, and at the same time, we're seeing all of these amazing Filipino movies coming up. We have, we're seeing the revival of OPM. So what's going on here? What has changed for the better? If not the government, maybe what's going on? Can you tell, tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I think things have changed from a, a T perspective. The adjustment tax was lowered from 30% to 10 uh, and we did have a system before where that remaining 10 could be waived. I think that was struck down by the Supreme Court a few years ago. But some uh, some cities uh, uh, do give some in tax breaks or tax incentives. And I think since the, the amusement tax is lowered, we've seen more and more films getting made. Um, we, there ha 